but we went six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully, some more people will come as the evening goes on. I'm Barb Mendenhall. I'm uh, the project manager for the EPA 319 grant that uh, is underway with the uh, Sangamon County Soil and Water District (CWLP) and the Lake Spring Lake Lake Springfield Watershed Resource Planning Committee. Uh, Glad to have everybody that's here. I don't know how many are on Zoom, but we welcome you also. Um, we're going to start this evening after a couple announcements. Uh, I just want to thank our team uh, in uh, working with me and basically since the beginning, prior to receiving the grant and then for the last two, little over two years. So I want to thank Shelly Seaman and Jake Bansell and Dan Grill, Sarah Lindholm, Quentin Jordan, and Michelle Kirby. Uh, anybody needs the uh, restroom through at the back, there's also refreshment set up for uh, drinks and some cookies back there. And uh, just appreciate you coming. Our first speaker tonight is Joe Bartletti. This uh, program is entitled Urban BMP Small Steps for Landowners, Giant Leaps for Watershed Health. Joe is an aquatic biologist, receiving his Bachelor of Science degree in zoology in 2001 from SIU Carbondale. He's a senior biologist at the Lock Mueller Group. He has worked on dozens of lakes and watersheds within Illinois and across the Midwest, conducting biotic surveys, providing restoration plans, and assessing various water quality impairments. He is an Illinois certified wetland specialist and serves on the board of directors for the Illinois Lakes Management Association. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the program over to Joe. Thank you, Barbara. I really appreciate that introduction. Yeah. Thanks for everybody for coming. I'm Joe Bartletti and my, as uh, Barb said, uh, let me give you a little bit more history about myself before we get started. I am a lifelong Sangamon County, Slash Springfield resident. I grew up here. This lake that I'm looking out uh, these windows at now is probably the reason I am a biologist. My grandpa took me here when I was, you know, just a wee lad and would fish this lake. And even more so, the, the Knights of Columbus, it's just a stone throw over there. I fish for crappie all uh, every year for many, many years. And so he, I have a lot of. Um, joy from this lake and a lot of reasons uh, to give back to the community. So um, as Barb mentioned, I went, to, I went to Rochester High School for my high school education. Then I went to Lincoln Land uh, to get an associate's degree before heading to Carbondale to get a Bachelor of Science in Zoology with a minor in chemistry. Before uh, heading back up this way to go work at UIS and do some nutrient um, studies on the LaGrange floodplain um, mitigation site in Brown County. Uh, I'm an aquatic ecologist with Bachman Group. My office is in Springfield downtown. I've been working and consulting for 18 years now and doing various things in environmental fields, but uh, with a particular emphasis and love for lakes, wetlands, streams. Um, I currently live out in Buckhart now. Um, I'm at the edge of the county, but I enjoy gardening. I love foraging. I still like to get out and fish. Botanize, um, do restoration uh, when I can. Also, love to you know get out and, and hear live music, especially bluegrass. So, I'm gonna jump into the presentation now. And first, we're gonna talk about you know water. We are uh, trying to do best management practices to control water. Water is extremely unique and vital resource to all human life. Um, frankly, we need to understand why we need BMPs. It's because we've had an abusive relationship with water for about the last hundreds of years. We've done a lot of things to the landscape that's changed the way water interacted uh, with the land. There's a great, great essay by a few of the greatest, some of the greatest ecologists, contemporary ecologists we have. Um, James Packett and Gerald Wilhelm produced the culture or the ecology and culture of water in 2008. I recommend everybody look that paper up and give it a read. It's great. But essentially, it talks about the failures of how we have basically 
went against nature. And instead of trying to live in harmony and do things in the way that makes sense with how the landscape reacted to water, we have been arrogant and thought we could engineer a way and a solution to most of our problems that we have today. So we now we've generated this class of stormwater management, best management practices to try to deal with these issues that we've caused. And the primary you know, focus of, of how we deal with storm and water management is to collect, convey, and discharge, which is counterintuitive to how the landscape uh, that we live on once lived, uh, that, how it worked. Um, we live in Illinois. Illinois is the prairie state. This is a map of the Prairie Peninsula. And you can see that all the green in that map shows what prairie looked like. We, as we once uh, know from studies as far back as the 20s and 30s, that when rainfall used to uh, fall from the sky in the prairie, very rarely did it actually ever physically touch soil. It intercept, was intercepted by the vegetation and it worked its way down the plant stems and leaves, then touched the ground and then was infiltrated. It really never ran off. There really wasn't um, what I would say surface water derived ecosystems. We basically, they, the, the prairie regulated everything within uh, the streams and, and lakes that we had in Illinois. It, it captured, it infiltrated, and then it slowly released water um, into these systems. And it kept the water cool and it, it, it was very stable. Things all developed over all the plants and animals developed to the stableness that the system has had. We've really disrupted this though now, and that is what I'm here to talk about is how can we maybe bring back a little bit of what we used to have into our, our homes and how can we emulate what the prairie once did uh, for water. We're on Lake Springfield. It's a giant watershed, as we all know. Um, it, it, it's, it's got a huge lake to watershed ratio. It, it's big. There's a lot of land that's not urban in the watershed. Basically, the majority of it is urban. However, there still is a little chunk that's residential urban land, and it represents about 3%. It doesn't sound like a lot on the scale of where you know we have problems, but it still represents a significant source of inputs to the lake because you're you're in close proximity and you have some you know real value in trying to do the best you can on that property. But this uh, the watershed based management plan was conducted and we identified a lot of different things and it, it's it's outlined a lot of areas where people can improve their water uh, through many different practices. But my uh, focus today is going to be on these urban BMPs. Oops. Sorry about that. Let me get out of that. Um, and it's going to focus on BMPs for homeowners. And this is just a map of Lake Springfield on the parks. I just wanted to, you know, point out where we're at. Nobody knows where we're at. We're all the way down here at Ridgeview Park in the arm of Sugar Creek. And, you know, I am very intimately familiar with the lake. And there's a lot of places we can do these BMPs for. for um, landowners uh, and homeowners. So I'm really going to talk about a few really uh, simple ones because I don't want BMPs to be overwhelming. You know, we're going to talk about rainwater harvesting. We're going to be talking about native plantings. We're going to be talking about rain garden bioswales, forest and permeable pavement um, alternatives. And we're going to talk about a few other things as well. Um, including regenerative stormwater conveyances. So rainwater harvesting, everybody knows about this. Rain barrels, cisterns, rain chains, all these different things that allow us to capture rainfall as it comes down. As I talked about before, rain never touched soil. So if we can do, it hits our, our um, roofs and runs off very quickly. Um, but just to give you some ideas, so one inch of rainfall on one square foot of, of surface area equals 0.63 gallons of water. So you got to start doing some math. You got to say, how big is my roof? How many square feet does it cover? And you can start to devise how many um, gallons of water a certain rainfall event will generate. And you can design systems to capture and collect all of that material. 
That rainwater is probably some of the most valuable things in garden. I covet it. I try to catch and collect as much as I can. Um, the designs on these things are endless. You can have really pretty ones. You can have homemade ones. You can have these fancy ones you buy at Home Depot. You can have them all linked together. You can build really cool um, covers for them. So people who have homeowner association covenants and say, I can't put one in. Well, I can probably you know build you one that nobody would even know you had a repair. So from that angle, you know, it's probably the first line of defense for a homeowner in terms of what can I do to help reduce some of this um, rainfall how, from getting into storm sewers and things. There's so many uses of rainwater and rainwater harvesting. We have people don't think of it in terms of you can use it in your swimming pool. You can use it for livestock watering. You can use it to wash your car, you can use it to do, you know, um, fire suppression. You can use it for all kinds of different things. Some people even use it in their gray water. They bring it back into their homes and use it in some of their plumbing to do um, work, uh, dishwater, uh, clean dishes to do um, some of their laundry. People uh, have gotten very innovative with the uses of rainwater. One of the more unique ones that I've seen that's not on my list is people are now actually trying to do rainwater capture in conjunction with solar panels and create these, their own miniature pump storage hydropower systems. Collecting rainwater on the ground, pumping it into a, a higher vessel during the day when the sun is shining using solar power, and then slowly releasing that water from the barrel at night down into your same barrel to generate power. There's a, a so many uses for it that to me, it's a very, 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 very easy one to implement. And I think, it, you know, I know there's a lot of the rebate programs. I think the, the city and the county at one time had, you know, we'll buy you your rain barrel or, or at least reimburse you for a portion of that. So it is essentially one of my first uh, lines of defenses that I would definitely recommend any person uh, want to get started with. So. That, that segues into native plants. Native plants are really important for, for BMPs, for homeowners. Native plants, um, they are extremely um, valuable tools for us because they, they don't you know, require very much water. They have very deep roots and anchor soil. The roots actually help to penetrate some of those deeper, more impermeable layers of clays and, and loams that then allow water to filter down into those deeper layers and provide some recharge of groundwater. You know, it, it's a very, um, you know, common thing for everyone to have lawns and how much water a lawn takes. It's extremely uh, large when you look at the percentage of somebody's bill about how much water is used um, just by watering your lawn. So I'm not saying everyone should take out all their lawns and plant native plants, but you know, let's think about if you, you know, aren't using 60% of your lawn, let's, let's, you know, turn that 40 per, or that keep the 40% lawn and turn the rest into native plantings. There is some maintenance required uh, with them. They can't just, you can't just turn them loose, but what can you turn loose with anything and have no maintenance? Very few systems, but they don't require fertilizer, which is another important part of that. But I mean, there's, um, they're superior erosion control. They filter stormwater. They do groundwater recharge. They're resilient. Um, they're, they, they provide soil organic matter. This is an image of one of the prairies the CBLP manages right there off West Lake Shore near Lincoln Land. And they've been doing a great job of doing continual maintenance on this. And this is just one example. We have lots of great examples of this from around the county. But these provide great wildlife habitat. I'm sure everyone's driven by that prairie has seen the fox that lives there, seen the deer, seen the other animals. So the benefits to not only water quality from prairie and native vegetation um, are, there's many other besides those. So um, that leads me into rain gardens. Rain gardens are kind of that next tier down the list in the urban BMPs. They incorporate native plants. They kind of capture rainwater, but they capture it on the ground. They're depressed little landscape gardens. They don't have to look wild and, and like a native planting would. It doesn't have to look like that prairie at West Lake Shore and East Lake Shore. Um, they, they basically, you know, you're mulching them. You're, you're designing these things to capture and store runoff. 
uh, from your from a roof, uh, from another part of your yard, from another part of the landscape. But um, they need to be sited appropriately. This is just a quick schematic to, to show you. You know, you want them to be away from your foundation. You want them to be downslope of drainage. You want them to have some energy dissipation coming into them, and you want to have a nice outlet. Um, you have to do some minimal engineering, and they do require some maintenance, but this is a, a great second step in urban BMPs. And they can be designed um, any size, you, you know, and, and you can do your math. Again, you know, your square footage of your roof. You can say, how big do I need this thing? And you can, you know, kind of start to lay these things out. You, you get a design. Um, it takes some basic planning, um, you know, but they can look beautiful. They can look so unique in a person's yard, um, you know, and again, they don't have to look wild. You can mulch around them, you can maintain, you can prune all the plants, but you really want them to be able to capture and pond up about 12 inches of water during a storm event so that they have some capacity to infiltrate water down uh, into the soil. That's really the, the goal of these is to, to collect the rainwater and to then get it down into the ground as fast as possible. They have some permeable layer that you uh, put a leaf beneath them and you scarify the, the existing native soil underneath to then create that pathways down. The native plants will establish and then help to create those pathways over time, but um, these things can be a, a huge asset and benefit to uh, a landowner and to a watershed if, if more people did these and they're appropriately sited over multiple places. So um, rain gardens, I'm a big fan of. Bioswales are kind of like the next step away from rain gardens. They don't necessarily have a, um, you know, defined point of entry in some instances. Sometimes they may just be a, a part of a larger conveyance of uh, what people would call a ditch or something. And these can look a little more wild at times. They can be full of plants or maybe not as landscaped, but they do a huge uh, ecosystem service by again, providing all these things that we've once lost that the prairie once provided. So when we can put little bits of this stuff back strategically in places that we need to capture, store, infiltrate these water, these, these things you know, are very, very um, useful and accommodating to um, existing roadsides, places we know we already have low standing water. We need, so it, it, bioswales are again, kind of that sister to rain gardens. Um, and they allow a lot of water to get back down where it wants to be, down in the ground. And they are important to that, for that element uh, as well. So, now we're going to get into something a little bit maybe more along with as an engineered or a hardscape system, but it is another urban BMP that I think, you know, landowners, especially around the lake, should consider if they're replacing and doing any kind of hardscaping or patio work or driveway work or parking lot work, you know, these types of systems have been proven and shown to be very, very effective in terms of their ability to capture store and infiltrate um, rainfall runoff. So um, they are provide spaces in between these pavers to allow water to travel and trickle down into. They can be all kinds of different things. I got on the left, you see just a couple little bricked paved areas going into your you know shed. And then you have something here, a larger parking lot with these gridded systems laid out. They're they're expensive. This is a not a, a you know typically a, a DIY project. Can it can it be done when it's on small scale? Absolutely. But these are typically something you're going to have to have design engineering and contractors involved with. However, um, the, you know a lot of times people say, oh, they're too expensive. Well, I don't know if you check the price of Portland cement these days, but it's. Um, it's pretty ridiculously high. And when you compare that to now what, you know, these alternatives and pavers that you can buy and, and get, it's starting to become comparable. And when you start to think about these least traveled uh, areas, driveway, parking lots, you know, why are we pouring, you know, deep concrete on these areas when we know the thaw, pre-thaw is probably gonna crack them in a few years anyways. And these systems then 
allow for some um, more targeted maintenance when areas fail. You can maybe just remove a small section of that. So these are uh, extremely important for when you start to get into that, I need to hardscape something. And I know the city's done a pretty good job of trying to do some of this work. And it's, like I said, it's expensive, but individual landowners should really put themselves in the position to now when they start to replace some of their systems, let's not put asphalt driveways back. Let's, let's do a quote on what it would take to permeable pave all that driveway into your property. No, it's expensive, but in the long run, it may save you money and the watershed is gonna benefit. So um, shoreline stabilization is another one that's kind of a hardscape thing, but I need, thought I, today I needed to talk about it a little bit since we've had so much revetment and offshore breakwater work here to highlight how important that work is to, um, to kind of the aesthetics and the quality of the lake and the, just that we're stabilizing those sediments that are on the bank that are directly interacting with the water that, you know, um, they come in contact with. So um, we, we typically treat these for littoral zone erosion. Uh, littoral zones are the shallow water in amongst the banks of the, the lake or reservoir. Um, we typically use a couple different kinds of treatments for shorelines. Like I stated, the, the revetment, which is basically sucked against the bank. And we have these offshore uh, breakwater systems that are pushed away slightly from the banks when the slopes are uh, too high to essentially stabilize them. We back off a little bit, put, put the rock out a little bit further. But these uh, shoreline stabilization techniques are primarily there for energy dissipation. We have these high wind and wave action environments that waves crash into these places and create instability. So we try to break up that energy by putting this rock in place. You can use plants to do this work too, but we really, you have to be cognizant of the conditions of where you put plants. I am a fan of putting plants and rock in a, in a kind of a hybrid system. The picture on the, that I show there for plants, that's water well. That's our most common plant here in Lake Springfield. And it's one of the greatest stabilizing plants for reservoirs that we can. It can grow in water up to three feet deep, but it's a great one to incorporate into your projects if you can and into your own home um, because it's very easy to collect the material and move it around because it, it has uh, grows from rhizomes and it transplants well. So here's a little bit of just, these are hard to see, but these are the typical styles I was talking about, the, the breakwater on the, the far lower, uh, my right, uh, your left. You can see the rock pile the, is set back from the shoreline a little bit and it allows this quiescent area behind the, the rock to form. We have some of that up in Lick Creek and at other various places around the lake. It's a really great form of shoreline stabilization because then it allows the banks to naturally stabilize themselves behind and revegetate and become um, something very, very um, good uh, for not only reducing sediment coming into the lake, but also then again for benefits of wildlife and other things. The revetment is here in the middle. That's the, it just basically, it's a pile of rock that it stabilizes the slope. It's appropriate. It goes all the way up to the bank, the high water mark, it extends above it. It has this ability then to just lock the soils in place and then it just provides in, uh, wind and wave dissipation so you don't continue to, to break that down. The living shore hybrids uh, are my favorite. They kind of incorporate a little bit of, of plants and hardened armor to create this environment where you get a hardscaped protection, but you get the benefits of having plants there as well. And you have to assess your conditions at your site to be able to know which is appropriate. To, you have to know the slope, you have to know the soil types. You just have to kind of make sure you, you do some work but the picture at the top kind of shows one where we have a hybrid system where there's some vegetation planted right at the shoreline edge where the revetment stops. And then it essentially provides a nice little buffer zone down to the lake. So you get kind of a benefit of both worlds. And that's really the system that is, you know, would be uh, the best around Lake Springfield in most situations for landowners. However, if you live in a cove and you have a high bank um, or something at the back of a cove, you might be a great candidate for a revetment style or a offshore breakwater type style. 
um, thing. Again, these are expensive. They are going to require a contractor to come out and put them in. Um, they they do have maintenance. You can't just throw a rock down and expect it to be you know there. You're going to have to go in there and and cut woody woody trees out. You're going to have to it's rock slough and ship. You may have to move some stuff around. So they're not purely maintenance free, but they do provide another good BMP for for homeowners to um, to go into. So. Um, I'm getting close on time here, but I want to got a few more slides. So my last one is this regenerative stormwater conveyance. It's a really new concept. It's a new thing for stormwater engineers. It's a really cool thing. They use biosubstrates. They take wood chips and sand and blend and make these unique bio infiltrated soil types. And they basically incorporate ideas and elements from stream uh, restoration, the ripple pool concept developed by Newbury and Garbery. Um, where you create sequences of ripples and pools to then dissipate energy and to store and infiltrate um, water. The upper uh, image shows kind of a, a schematic of what one of these things looks like. It comes in off the pipe, it goes down through this series of stepped pools, um, and then it, it, it infiltrates into the sandy wood chip carbon rich matrix, and it has benefits for infiltration, water quality, peak volume reduction, low reduction, all um, those are very important. And, and this is kind of one of what it looks like while they're constructing. You have these big kind of um, stones that you would place. And these are on, and these can be flexible and, and fit to different slopes, different sizes of, of applications. So they're very unique in, in terms of what their capability. They've just kind of come around over the last four or five years and people are starting to do these more out in Chesapeake Bay. We see a lot of this in Wisconsin. We've seen a lot of this work, um, but here's kind of another image of them. You can see this is a, uh, a roaded kind of gully that came off of a street in, in an urban area. Then it, the nat so you follow this natural drainage, but you know you don't just want to start throwing rock in there. You want to fill that channel back up to what the original ground surface would be, and then you would you fill in with those materials, and then you reconnect the floodplain. You you allow water then to interact and rehydrate the floodplain and the soils that it once maybe would have uh, had uh, interaction with. But you have to do some specialized things to like keying in rocks and things because these things can have some high flows through them. Because you do want to try to design them to be for a big event, a 10 year 24 event, which is a lot of rain. So with that said, I'm kind of segueing in. We have this really other cool system and, and it's, I'm seeing a little thunder from our World Rock Next presenters, but we have this regenerative wetland conveyance at, at Nipper and it's applicable to large landscapes where we can put these things on an inline, um, an existing eroded ditch, and we can create a system that is a workhorse, that is a powerhouse, an engine for nutrient processing, for volume reduction, for peak flow reduction, and for wildlife habitat, all in one unit. We can see that the inflows are the two upper bottles, and by the time you get down to some of the lower ends, there, it's, it's very, very minimal amounts of sediment and material are being released back into the watershed. So this is a um, really unique system. But in summary, what we really need to do is you can do a lot of little things to make a big impact. You know, just talking to people, telling people. If you see problems, reporting them. But you know, remember, every half inch of rainfall that falls on, on 1,000 square foot of impervious surface is 310 gallons water. Just remember that. You can start to store and capture and infiltrate all that stuff before it gets off and runs off into the, to a storm sewer. But we want to change that from convey, uh, collect, convey, discharge is to capture, collect, store, reuse, or intercept, infiltrate, recharge, regenerate. We want to use positive connotations when we're trying to do these BMPs. But what we need, really need to do is develop a new relationship with water. We need to respect water again. We need to tell nature that we're sorry for all the things we did to it and need to start working in conjunction to, to untangle these systems and put them back. But we need to start small and think big. And there's a bunch of uh, toolboxes and things for neighborhood technology that allow you to, to plug in and see which one you get the biggest bang for your buck for your project. But I have a bunch of references from what I got and I'd be happy to share those with you at the end, but that's all I have. And I'm uh, here to take some questions now. Thank you.
Anybody have any questions for Joe? Okay. Yes. For your rainbow, what were you trying to control? Are you trying to control nutrient uptake? Are you trying to control sediment? What are you really trying to get there? Well, rain gardens are kind of a uh, primarily for volume reduction and, and peak flow reduction. Um, if you're trying to prevent water from getting into storm sewers, it's a great way to infiltrate it back down in the ground. And then that rain garden then will help to remove some of those um, nutrients and things that are coming off your own property. Now, they're not a huge benefit for water quality um, in terms of nutrient reduction, but they will provide some because they're Volume reduction is helping to lessen the amount of nutrients that are exiting more proper, infiltrating, going back and forth. Where would we find a list of uh, native plants? Um, there's a lot of different resources out there that um, we can, I can help provide you with. But there's, if you do a uh, few Google searches on for Illinois rain garden plants, I think you probably get a, a good list. But there's nurseries that carry those specifically. And these, I would recommend buying plants for a rain garden so that you would be able to, to landscape plug those in. But I can help you out with that after the, but um, that's, that's, that's not a real big challenge on those, is getting them to plant mature because you don't need a whole lot of plants for a rain garden. You want them to be space appropriate to it, just like a garden, you want them to grow. A bioswale, something like that, you kind of maybe can see, and you would put more plants in there because you wanted to get more um, coverage and, and have that ability, but that's the the major difference between rain gardens and bioswales is kind of that landscape versus non landscape look. But we can help you plant uh, lists and locations for sure. The University of Illinois Extension, who was kind of January, over the world, has done a workshop on rain gardens and bioswale construction. So I think if you go on their webpage, you might be able to find uh, some brochures, which they have given me once, um, but I think are absolutely. In one of your slides, you had a water plant that you said really prolific in this area. Water well, yeah, water well, Justicia americana. It's um, a very unique plant to, to, I would love to have known exactly its, its primary habitat before we came, but if you look around the reservoir here, a lot of the shorelines have it, and it has a pretty little pink, whitish flower, but it's it's definitely one that this lake has plenty of. So, anybody else have anything? I'm here. I'm here for the duration. I'm, so, if you want to talk later, and I have some cards later. If anybody wants to grab one of those, then give give me a call anytime. I'm, I'm happy to talk with you. So, thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Joey. Yes. And we are recording this, so it will be on our Sangamon County Soil and Water website. Um, shortly within a few days after tonight's event. So, um, and like uh, Tom mentioned, we're actually doing a, a demonstration project out at the uh, UIS field station and we're putting in rain gardens and rain barrel systems. So, I provided with an educational aspect. The students will be doing some writing on different uh, things out there at the, at the field station. So you can expound on that. Okay, Tom Rothfuss is our next presenter. Okay, a little bit about Tom. Tom received his PhD from the Department of Geophysical Sciences at the University of Chicago in 2005, where he studied paleoecology. Did I get that right? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. He currently serves as director of the UIS Thurkelson field station at Emmaquan and its field station here at Lake Springfield. His current research interests focus on the Emmaquan Preserve, Illinois River, and Lake Springfield and issues of freshwater quality. So at this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Tom. Thank you, Mark. 
Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today are a couple different projects that we've had going on at the UIS field station at Lake Springfield, looking at different aspects of the water system. Uh, so I'm going to talk about freshwater mussels, I'm going to talk a little bit about plastic, and then I'm also going to talk about plankton. Uh, these things may seem like they are completely unrelated, uh, but they all have the same theme for me, and that they have a great deal to do with our water quality, especially when we're talking about a place like uh, Lake Springfield. So I'm going to start with freshwater mussels. Um, historically, there were 80 species of freshwater mussel found within Illinois um, that were native here. Currently, more than half of them are, are threatened, endangered, or extinct. Um, we're down to about 59 species in the state. Um, 11 of these are only found in a small stream here or there, so their numbers might even be lower than that for what we currently have around. Um, but historically, they were, were incredibly abundant in our waterways and very important for us. Uh, one of the main tasks that they provide for the environment is they clean water. They're filter feeders, they're constantly sucking in water, filtering out the particles that are there and depositing it back into the sediment. Um, they create habitat um, in our waterways, they stabilize things. They also create habitat by partitioning nutrients. I'll talk a little bit about some of that later, but one of the great things they do is they remove phosphorus, they remove nitrogen, they stick this stuff into the sediment, and that's other plants grow in those areas, and that's the added benefit that it takes that stuff away from elsewhere in the waterway. Um, and they're also a great food source for aquatic and terrestrial predators, not so much anymore because their numbers have dropped so much, but we have a lot of predators that are dependent on things like this for food. Um, I think it's good to have predators around, it's good to have prey animals around, it's good to, in general to have lots more biodiversity. So anything that these things can do to help in that way is always good. So I had a student a couple of years ago who wanted to work on freshwater mussels. She'd done a lot of fisheries work and was really interested in them. Um, and so we decided to look at how they filter feed and, and what they're doing when they're removing um, sediment from the column. And so what Dakota did is she collected some mussels, we had permits for this, um, and we had some aquaria set up at the field station. She put the, the mussels in some of those tanks and we started adding lake water to them and watching how quickly the mussels are able to clear up the system. So, oh, did I do something wrong? So this is a time-lapse video that takes place over five hours, but it's only gonna be up there for 30 seconds, so don't worry. And so what you saw in the beginning is you could not see anything in the background. We have a checkerboard back there, and you're seeing how much these mussels are removing from that water. They're moving a little bit. This guy up front, you may have noticed, was dropping some sediment back into the, to the surface there. Um, there was a mussel moving faster than you will able to see one in the background room for a second there. But in five hours, they took that water where you could barely see anything in that tank to make it perfectly clear. Um, and so just to, to show this again, this is a couple different tanks where she had done it for 24 hours. The tank on the top, there were no mussels in it, dropped the same amount of water in there from the lake. After 24 hours, you still cannot see the background through that tank at all. Maybe it's cleared up just a tiny bit. This other one, 24 hours later, everything's perfectly clear. You can pick out individual sand grains there. So they have done a fantastic job of taking all the sediment, the nutrients, the other particles out of that waterway. Um, and made that water nice and clear. In the wild, this would of course benefit aquatic plants and other things that can now grow at deeper depths. They're able to get that sunlight down there, um, but also makes things generally better overall. So freshwater mussels do great things, but as I said, they're, they're really threatened in the state right now and, and nationwide are native mussels. Uh, I just want to talk about a few of those threats just so we can keep them in mind as we try to do things to help these guys out in the future. Uh, a big one has been over harvesting. Um, most of this happened in the early 1900s for buttons. Um, most people used to have wooden buttons on their shirts because that's what we could afford. As washing machines that had hand rollers were invented and you started rolling a wooden button through there, it would slip along the grain and then your button wasn't very useful. Uh, so some clever people figured out they could get a mussel shell, drill out these blanks, and turn them into buttons that everyone could use. And, and mussel buttons were pretty common until about the 1950s when plastic came in and took over uh, as a much cheaper option for that. So 
There are places all throughout the southeast and the Midwest where you can go find um, former button factories on different rivers and streams. Um, they have huge piles of, of abandoned mussels like this behind them. Um, and so that shows you just the level of how much has been done. They pick up the factory and move it somewhere else once they were done with the mussels in that area. Currently, um, North American freshwater mussels continue to be harvested in some places. If you help out the cultured pearl industry over in Asia, uh, we've discovered that the shell of our native mussels from here are some of the best seeds you can do if you're trying to artificially grow pearls and oysters elsewhere. Uh, so they're still harvested for that purpose. Um, pollution and siltation have been big things. Pollution, of course, if we put lots of pesticides, herbicides, other chemicals into the water, oil, things like this, these filter feeders who are pumping everything in, and imagine it's not good for them long term to start getting all those things stuck in their bodies. Um, and then all these sediment that we've added because of increased erosion, uh, and a lot of the problems that were just being referenced earlier in Joe's presentation there as well. Um, they've lost a lot of their habitats as we've straightened out streams and rivers, and also as we've built locks and dams, that's altered their habitat. And then competition with invasive species. You've probably all heard about zebra mussels and some of these other forms. Um, they do come, compete quite a bit with our native mussels out there. Um, one that I do want to mention a little bit more about, just because I think it's particularly cool, is the locks and dams. So the native mussels we have here in North America have a really unique reproductive strategy. Um, so after the uh, eggs and sperm get together, the female has young, they're developing. What she does is waits or tries to lure in a fish, a particular hook fish, close to her, and then she will spit all her babies out at that fish. They'll stick to the gills, they'll stick to the fish, and they hang out as parasites for a short while. They use that fish to move. So they can get deposited in a new section of the river. So they can move 25, 50 miles that way by hitchhiking on a fish. These mussels otherwise couldn't make, be able to do that. Uh, but one of the things, so there's one of these mussels and she's got her lure out right now on our tank. She's trying to attract the fish who's not coming because this is a small aquarium in a lab. Um, but that's what she's doing so she can spit those babies out. Different species of mussel actually use very different lures because many of them are specific to a certain type of fish host that they'll use. Um, and so there are situations in the Western United States, for example, where the, uh, the fish host is locally extinct and there are mussels who are out there sometimes for a hundred years or more just waving their lure, hoping that this fish will come by so they can spit out their babies and unfortunately it will never happen. Um, so this is sort of a, an interesting story about how these mussels reproduce and how we made things very difficult for them to get new places. We've overfished some of the fish that they depend on, but we've also constructed dams, locks, and other things that prevent those mussels from ever making it to new parts of the river because uh, their fish host can't get to that space as well. So moving on from mussels, uh, that's my mussel story. We can talk about it later if you want. Um, another big project that I'm involved with looking at plastics and microplastics, especially found in and around fresh waterways here in central Illinois. Um, we've all heard lots of things about plastic in our environment. I'm sure you've heard of the, the big garbage patches in the different oceans, the gyres going on with those. Um, global plastic production is, is pretty crazy how much we have. In the 1950s, when they first started making those plastic buttons, there was maybe 2.3 million tons of plastic being produced a year. Get to more recent times, and we're producing over 450 million tons of plastic each year. Um, so that's a lot of plastic. All told, it's somewhere around 7 billion tons of plastic, and this figure's old is probably closer to eight or nine now, um, that we have generated in the world. Unfortunately, about 9% or less has been recycled. Somewhere around 12% has probably been incinerated or burned in one way or another. The remaining 80% or so is in our environment and in our land. Um, plastic has great qualities, that's why we produce so much of it, but one of these qualities is that it's never going to go away. And so we keep, even when you have something sitting out, uh, a little sand bucket or something like that, it breaks down to the sun, it doesn't go away. It just becomes smaller and smaller pieces uh, that find its way into more and more parts of our, our environment and ecosystem. Um, down here, 83% of tested tap water samples from municipalities from around the world uh, have been found to contain plastic fibers. Um, so that's coming out of tap water. Um, 
Plastics have been found to aid in transferring persistent organic pollutants and viruses and other things that hitchhike by taking a ride and biofilms might accumulate on the plastics as they're moving through their waterways. Um, so these are a growing problem. Uh, these days you see lots of studies where people will talk about finding microplastics in rainwater and snow in Antarctica and places like this. I've ceased to be amazed by any of those stories. What will truly amaze me is if you find a spot where we cannot find plastics somewhere out in the world. Um, and that would be the more amazing part of it. Uh, so what are we doing? So working with one of my colleagues at UIS, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Hansen in the Environmental Studies Program, we've been trying to document the occurrence of fishing and tobacco-derived plastic litter around the Lake um, we interview users at the sites about their habits and attitudes toward litter and plastic. This is where we bring some of the social sciences into it. Um, but we're also collecting and recording where we are finding all these different items when we're out there. Uh, so tobacco, um, one of the reasons we focused on that is no matter where you go in the world, we're looking at litter studies, um, cigarette butts, parts of cigars, all these things are always the leading item that you're finding in, in litter. Um, so we thought we'd look at that. And cigarette butts in particular are really interesting because most people do not realize that they're about 98% plastic. Um, the whole filter is a, an acetate, it's a plastic product, all those fibers in there. I've talked to people who think they're cotton, they're definitely not cotton. It's little bits of plastic that now relate to toxins that you're throwing out into the environment there. Um, initially, we we're going to start just with cigarette butts, and then we found uh, the cigar tips are really pretty common as well around the lake, um, a nice plastic item. And then with fishing items, those again are very common litter item we can find, um, whether it's styrofoam bait containers, if it's bobbers, if it's lures, or if it's the fishing line itself. Um, at some of the parks around the lake, including one just right over there, there's these little J-shaped PVC pipes. Uh, for fishermen to dispose of their extra line that they maybe have to cut loose or they wasted in some way. Um, this is what we collected. I think that was six months worth of line that came out of those. I estimated it was somewhere around 12 miles worth of line um, that we were collecting in those containers. Unfortunately, we also found lots of line that was not making its way into those containers. Um, so part of what I did is that we went to various parks around the lake, we collected litter, we GPSed every piece that we found, documented where we were getting things. This is a map we produced um, to help CWLP up by Tamadonia Park. Uh, sort of a heat map, so the brighter colors are where there was more fishing line being found, the cooler colors there was less fishing line being found, but still fishing line there. Uh, what's interesting here, there's a star there, that's where one of those J-shaped pipes is. Um, so we collected a lot of line in there, but the reason it's red hot is there was also lots of fishing line lying on the ground around that pipe there. Whether it's people who were trying to throw away their line and found out that there were uh, cups and things shoved in there, blocking their way, or they dropped the line, or who knows, whatever. Um, but lots of fishing line at these spots. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is how far are people willing to actually walk to dispose of some of these products when they're out there. Uh, these different lake sites, and again, trying to work with CWLP on that. Uh, I mentioned before, cigarette butts. This is one that we're also really interested in. This was a couple years ago at the uh, Lindsay Boat Launch area. A uh, couple weeks apart, we picked up every cigarette butt that we could find in the parking lot and documented its location. Size of the circles corresponds again to how many butts we were finding in those areas. Um, and again, using these maps, we're hoping to work with CWLP on ways where we can increase areas to dispose of things, but perhaps also uh, increase ways that we can message with the community about uh, the impacts of their litter and, and how we can control this. Because all these things, of course, are, are right on the shoreline and will quickly find their way into our water systems. So moving from plastic, we'll shift to plankton. Um, so plankton, they're just a collection of organisms. You've all heard of them probably. Uh, they can include plants, animals, and bacteria that are found in our marine and freshwater systems. They're everywhere. If it rains, we can go to a puddle and we can find some plankton who have already managed to find their way to there. They're pretty amazing critters. Um, they drift or weakly swim around in the water columns, so they really have very little say about where they go, um, mostly where the waves and the wind takes them. 
The largest plankton we generally talk about is five millimeters, so pretty small. The smallest ones are somewhere around five microns or so that I would consider within the plankton that we're dealing with there. Uh, so dramatically smaller and definitely not visible to the naked eye. Um, they're really important organisms, um, especially marine plankton, provide a huge amount of the oxygen that we're breathing on a daily basis. Um, but they also provide the base of pretty much all food chains. They're feeding fish, they're feeding birds, feeding everything else that, that might depend on these organisms. One group, though, that's, that's not so great within the plankton, at least most of the time, or some of the time now in the modern world, are called cyanobacteria. So they're a type of plankton, but when they get uh, an excess of nutrients, especially phosphorus, um, that's available in the water, they can rapidly multiply. And these are the harmful blooms that you often hear about when people are talking about different freshwater ways. They're being caused by, by any number of a, a group of cyanobacteria out there. Um, they cause the taste and odor issues that you sometimes hear about. Um, in some cases, they can even cause toxic conditions in the waterways that have been especially harmful to pets, dogs, things like that that will be drinking from lakes or ponds that are affected with the cyanobacteria. Uh, so we've been begun working with CWLP to help identify when cyanobacteria numbers are climbing, um, and we believe it's impossible. We're in the first year of some of this work. Hopefully, as we get another year or two under our belts with some of this plankton data, we'll be able to start doing some, some nicer models where we'll be able to make some predictions about these things. Uh, so the way we do this, traditionally, you use a microscope, you get a little little special slide that had all these little boxes on it. You put one milliliter of water in there, drop a cover plate on there, and spend hours counting and then identifying plankton within that slide. Uh, we have this piece of equipment called a flow cam, which is basically a, a fancy microscope that's hooked up to a computer. As we put a water sample in there, uh, it passes past the microscope, which takes pictures um, on the order of as it may matter what we're looking at, about 24 pictures per second. And while it's doing that, the artificial intelligence within the computer is identifying the particles that it can pull out of that, that image. Um, we then generate thousands and thousands of images, generally very rapidly. Uh, the other day, there's a lot of stuff in the, in the water right now because temperatures have warmed up nicely and we have nutrients out there. And half a milliliter after sieving it through a pretty fine fraction, um, I was getting around 15,000 particles, um, and that's roughly imaging one third of them. So the water is just loaded with different things out there. Um, but we can generate a lot of data pretty quickly. You already can see, even right after we ran a sample, we're already getting charts and graphs showing us the sizes of things, the shapes. Um, and we can use this to make force filters where we can start to identify when are the cyanobacteria starting to show up. So here's just a couple, couple images from, from the flow cam there. Most of these plankton on the lower part of the slide are pretty typical, not very harmful uh, plankton out there. There are a lot of good critters that you like to see around. On this upper image, um, all these sort of log spirally chain guys with these different nodes on them, uh, those are all a type of cyanobacteria called anabina. Um, and so we start to find more and more of those guys out there generally as things warm up um, in different waterways. And, and certain numbers, they're really not a problem. They're part of the natural system, but we can always hit levels um, where they start to become a bigger and bigger issue for us. And so that's what we're trying to keep an eye on. Um, so some basic things with cyanobacteria, what are ways that we can help reduce them from having any of these blooms in our waterways? One, of course, is to, to be careful with fertilizers or don't use fertilizers at all or near waterways or areas that receive runoff um, or whose runoff will go into waterways. I think that's an important one for people living within watersheds to keep in mind. Just because you are not on the lake doesn't mean that the water from the sewer right in front of your house or the storm drain isn't going to find its way to that lake. And so if you're throwing on excessive nitrogen trying to make your grass look green, um, you're also causing problems in that area. Uh, if you have septic systems, be sure you maintain them. Again, this helps reduce the nutrients popping out there. Um, just like we heard in the last presentation, establish buffers of native vegetation around waterways. Great way to reduce the runoff going in there, increase uh, the water that can get absorbed before it gets there. And those plants will happily take up the excess nutrients before it hits the water if they can. Uh, and then lastly, support and protect our native wildlife. Um, waterways, and some cool research in the Southern US, 
Waterways without native mussels have been found to have higher levels of cyanobacteria, something like 26, 27% higher um, than waterways that did have native mussel population. And interestingly, the zebra mussel is not a good substitute. Waterways that have zebra mussels in them tend to have higher uh, frequencies of cyanobacteria outbreaks um, because what they're doing is slightly different within those waterways. And so this is another reason where, if I bring it back to the beginning, the lowly mussel that nobody ever thinks about is really capable of doing a lot of incredible things for our, our environment. So wrapping things up, where do we go next? Um, big thing for me and for the students I work with is we don't just want to document problems. I don't want to just tell people we have no mussels, we have cyanobacteria, and we have lots of plastic. So uh, we're pretty much in the problem. Um, I don't just want to do that. We want to look for ways that we can try to make things better. Uh, so we intend to keep doing research on some of these different water quality and watershed issues. Um, but an important part is to make sure that we relate it to the public and find ways that we can share the science with the public uh, in a way where people trust us as well. Scientists have sort of had problems with some of that of late. Uh, with my social science colleagues, we're really trying to examine the personal side of the story and see if we can, can get people to better connect with their environment and their waterways. Uh, what might change attitudes and opinions? Um, and some of this is these, these storytelling things. Uh, up from the St. Lawrence watershed, they have a, a big thing about the garbage fish that they do with kids. Um, thought about some stuff here where maybe we can work with some of the art groups on that. Uh, one of my colleagues up at UIC, she, she does a lot with getting people's stories and getting them to, again, think about their different waterways. She's worked in Lake Michigan. We're trying to move on now the whole way we're going to spring field uh, stuff on that. Uh, we also have some demonstration projects. Barbara was mentioning those earlier. A lot of these, I got the rain barrel setups. We have sort of a bioswale rain garden mixed area. Uh, we have areas using buffalo rack as a field station. Great native grass doesn't need to be mowed very often. Once it's established, you don't need to water it, fertilize it, do anything to it, um, and it will, will be there. And we have some little pollinator areas as well that act as buffer strips. This year, those plants are just getting going, so they don't look like a whole lot, but I think in two or three years, those areas will be very attractive. Uh, we're working on signage and literature and other information that we'll be able to distribute on those things. Uh, and then the last note up there is, I'll be at the Harvest Festival at the Lincoln Memorial Garden, along with some of my social science colleagues, talking with people about waterways, water research, history of water, and their relationship with water. Um, we'll be there the 8th and the 9th of October, so if you're in the area, uh, please feel free to stop by and see us there. If you want to learn more about either of our field stations, those are the two addresses. Basically, it's uis.edu slash either Emmaquan or Lake Springfield. At the Lake Springfield site, if you click on research tab, we have two different videos about freshwater mussels there that my student Dakota had prepared. One is sort of for a general audience, and then one is about Mabel the mussel, which is focused for kids to learn more about freshwater mussels. Uh, so feel free to check those out. Uh, there's my email address if you want to get a hold of me, and I can take any questions that you might have. And I think I'm just on time. <laughs> What is the population of the most of the Lake Springfield? Um, where it should be? Or? No, it's definitely a lot lower than you would want. There are, I've come across, I haven't done a real survey here, just based on dead ones that I find. I've seen about four different species out there. One of the issues, a lot of them prefer moving waterways. And Lake Springfield, the way it's, it's sort of impounded like that, creates sort of a funny situation. But you will find uh, we'll walk the shores. There's one that's from Lake from about this side, right around here, um, called the Giant Floater. Um, they like lakes, they like backwaters. Uh, you'll find them out there. There's also one that can get even bigger called the Flat Floater. I believe I have one up here in this place. So there are some here, um, but their numbers are definitely a lot lower than you would want to have. There are places. Um, farther north of Illinois, where they have started to go to park districts to, to farm freshwater mussels, raising them in the lab, and then re releasing them out into the different streams and waterways. Um, so that's being done in Illinois. It's been done off in the Chesapeake. We're doing that. I think Philadelphia is exploring um, getting 
muscles where they're raising them in the lab and then we're attaching them to floating platforms, letting them pump water out, um, maybe clean that stuff up along the way. One of the challenges um, sometimes with some of the water, water treatment facilities is the zebra mussels, the invasive ones, are terrible with water treatment. They, the way they attach, they get stuck in the works. Our native mussels, they don't attach to anything, they get sort of like lay in there. And set up. So that's that problem, that base style problem. Of the cyanobacteria, uh, you, you just started really trying to find research. Uh, yeah. uh, the, what would be a measurement of dangerous problems for cyanobacteria? That's one of the things we're working on figuring out. So the top of uh, sort of Toxins that they produce are actually pretty difficult to measure outside of the pretty high tech analytical lab. Um, if you were not a paleontologist, I'm not suitable for doing that level of uh, like titration studies. Uh, I have to work with some of my chemistry colleagues to produce the best measure on that. Um, in most, most of the literature that I've gone through, where we're working on cyanobacteria and their abundance and scattering of water treatment facilities, the main issue they have to deal with is mostly with the case of order issue, not with the, the toxin levels. Uh, so that's certainly something that I know within that industry they're looking at ways to more quickly be able to measure it and almost be more field measurement with these toxin levels. Because right now it's it's quite high tech. Oh, I was just going to add. Yeah, if you want to add a discussion, yeah. So, uh, the water treatment side was out there for 20 years. Uh, you know, one of the cyanobacteria decay byproducts is what we really, a couple of what we really look at, both the and the MIB. And to analyze for those two elements, we have to send our um, samples down to Jacksonville, Florida. So, we get in the middle of a big cyanobacteria bacteria run, we'll probably send the samples out three times a week, kind of get data back. Um, typically, we just do it once every couple of weeks or something like that in the off peak time. Like Tom was saying, this is the peak time right now. End of July to basically beginning of October, that's when you typically have those big issues. So, hopefully, with them sending some samples out periodically on that. We'll be able, we're going out every two weeks and going to Quinton when we do the sample and we get our cyanobacteria counts. We can start relating some of those counts that we're seeing to the levels that we're also finding in the water. And in a year or two, maybe that's where we can start making some predictions. I think the interesting bridge is like in the water treatment world, civil engineering world, right? There's not a lot of research done tying those two together. You know, we've got these two byproducts that cause us issues, some of which we can treat for and some of which we really don't have the technology to treat for. So to, to be able to tie you know, microbiology and biology out and lay directly to that, try to stop it at its source is really what we're after, as opposed to investing in millions of dollars in the infrastructure that we only use a couple months out of the year. That's good. Have you done any correlation studies to nutrients in the lake that's relative to the algae growth? So that's part of the plan for what we're doing right now. So this is the first year that we've been gathering um, plankton numbers out there. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of time before we have an update. But so one of the things that's interesting, this is where the, the muscle play is that interesting part of it. So in this, this when Nitrogen is limited, which it often is, but phosphorus is abundant. The cyanobacteria numbers will soar. And those little guys were pointing out those nodes. One of the cool things about a cyanobacteria is it can fix nitrogen just like soybeans can in the atmosphere. So it's not nitrogen limited. The areas where the muscle are, they're pumping the, the phosphorus out as well. And so it's making it nitrogen phosphorus limited. And that's when these diatoms, which are sort of cool, generally not a problem. Uh, plankton, although they do fly filters sometimes, they have little silica bodies, um, but they're a, a, a nice algae plankton food source out there. Their numbers will jump off um, 
longer in the interval. And so it's it's this thing where if we can do a better handle on the phosphorus, especially, um, that can help have uh, an impact on how these dynamic bacteria are going to go. And so it comes from that. again, we're taking the measurements and getting other things in place, doing these buffer strips. Uh, one thing I really want to play around with uh, are these loading treatment wetlands. I've talked about them before. These last one are good plants growing out and the roots go down into the water column, which is fucking up nutrients in there. Um, and there's been good success with those elsewhere with picking up heavy metals, um, moving atrazine, great at moving atrazine, uh, but these that can pull things out of the water. So we're figuring out what plants to do, where to put these, probably a particular focus on things getting after to that phosphorus um, would be great ways to go on that. That's what we've seen. The limited data we have there is the most direct correlation is the phosphorus. So we'll, we'll see these MIB numbers climb when the, when the phosphorus spikes in the lake. It isn't one to one correlation, but that's the closest nutrient we've seen having the highest correlation. Yeah, it, biologically, that makes a lot of sense. So that's good. What's the problem with the phosphorus in Around here? I don't know. I think average depth about 17 feet. I mean, there's a lot of areas that are really six feet. So, in rivers, a lot of the mussels live in, in quite shallow water. Um, so, that's where part of the way the lake is. If not, the deeper areas probably are managed to have a path for them. Um, like when you're doing stream collections for mussels, oftentimes you can be waiting for the weight deep um, and actually feeling around for them. Um, so Often they prefer not to be super deep. Um, I don't know the forms out here specifically can, how can they can they move themselves. They can hop a little bit, but as they start getting bigger and they're growing in place, they sort of get stuck because they they like to just have a little bit sticking up. I don't know why I'm doing that, me, but a little a little bit sticking out where they can get their siphon out, and then as they're growing, more and more of them in that sediment, so they're wedged pretty tight in there. Uh, one thing in the water depth, I just realized up at Emma we get a lot of black floaters there that survive from the farm ditches in that area. Um, and so they were living in ditches that were high and probably around the country. So they, they should be the flat floaters, giant floaters, intact with most of the depth out uh, here based on that. Can they be displaced by waves? It'd have to be a good one, um, but probably could. Otters pull them up. I found. Um, for a spoiled pile for hours, but definitely pull one up and sort of can see the way they broke the shell in two different bits. A couple of years ago, the lake was low. Uh, I live on the lake. I went out there for, just to check on things, and there must have been four dozen lakes to the uh, shells that they don't go. And in addition to that, there's another couple dozen on top of my floating seating dock. I know I've got a link in the neighborhood. Yep, link will do it. But Lake is losing muscles. Just the hunters. I imagine I've got that right. Oh, yeah, fortunately, for now, because we're not commercially harvesting them in any way here. So it would be predators, um, it could be potentially certain simulation of pollution. Some of these species can live 100 years or more. If you can filter in water, I know the lake is we're about that old. But if you've been out there filtering highway runoff and things like that for that many years, it's probably not good for that much overall. Um, but yes, they, they should have the ability in theory to replenish some of the numbers out there as well, provided right? we have the appropriate fish for those species. Potentially. Um, although some of those guys are good divers. <laughs> We'll go down there and, and find them out there. Um, but they also are a good indicator of where I've been from that they see uh, every summer in shallow water. You'll see, and this is good because of good reason for some of the depth, uh, the water temperature can get to them because we drop oxygen at that point. Um, that We're going to take a real short break. A minute break, we'll go back and get some cookies and drinks and use restroom. We'll get started again.
Hi, Carol. Do you have a question? I did. I did. Um, I, I've heard uh, the talk about cyanobacteria, and I'm not a scientist by any means. I'm just a, a homeowner that lives on the lake and, um, and a, a native plant aficionado. So if you look at my yard, it's, it's half to three quarters prairie. Um, so I was glad to, to hear about putting native plants right at the water's edge, which is I've got riprap and then a, a native area. Uh, my question is, I also, I'm out there paddle boarding in the mornings and Monday mornings, there will be a film and I live on the west side, just across from Adams Wildlife. Um, mm -hmm. There'll be a film on the lake that it looks like, you know, like oil or, or fuel of some sort from weekend traffic. And I, I haven't heard anybody address that. And I was wondering, uh, that's a touchy subject, right? Because everybody thinks the lake is for recreation. Well, guess what? You're drinking that. Um, so I, I would really like to hear a discussion on what is that, that is that detrimental? How detrimental is it? Um, what, if anything, can be done or is being done? The is being done, I don't know. Um, and one of the things we'd have to do is get out there and get a, a sample of it just to see what really, what it is. Um, yeah. Some of the cyanobacteria actually can look at times almost like a, an oil or a, sometimes even almost like paint on the water surface. Um, so it's, oh, really? possible, it's possible that it could be that given the amount of jet ski and other traffic, it's probably fuel. Um, but you'd have to get a, a sample to take a look at that for sure. Well, that would be, I think that's something that's important to be looked at in addition to all this other stuff is what happens when we have high usage and how that affects the muscles and the plankton and everything else. Yep, no, I, I think you're definitely right about that. Um, all those pollutants, I mean, none of them are, are good for these organisms. Most of them are. A lot of those critters are highly sensitive, um, and so it doesn't take a lot, um, say, a per gallon basis, in order to disrupt their life cycle on that. Um, I was talking about the cigarettes. It's been if you take a couple gallon aquarium and you put Daphnia, a uh, common plankton in there, a bigger zooplankton that you could see with your eye. I think it's two cigarettes per gallon um, will kill them, and so certainly any of these other particles are not great. I might be slightly off on my numbers, but it's in that range. Wow. Wow. Okay. So what can I do as a homeowner to help? Is there any, are we going to get to that in this, in this program? I'm not sure if the later ones today will, um, but we're definitely working on that. And that's some of the stuff at the, the Lake Springfield field station trying to set up some demonstration sites there where, where people can come in and see what we're doing. And hopefully okay. where we can also be measuring things and saying, this is helping with this. So you can say, yeah. well, what can I do and why should I do it? Right, right. All right, well, thank you for your good work. This is the pointer. The, pointer. Mm -hmm. the green button is for the pointer, and then this is to go left to right. We'll advance this. Okay. I might just sit if that's okay. Hey, do you? Do the pointer, yeah. <laughs> I was worried about tripping over that big, so I'm like, I don't know. Rotate the same area. Right. <laughs> 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 
Getting used to sitting next to that window. I did. I Okay, we're going to go ahead and resume tonight. Um, our next uh, speaker is Quentin Jordan, who's going to be talking about the Mayor's Monarch Pledge and Monarch Conservation. Quentin's an engineering technician for at CWLP. He has a bachelor's degree in biological sciences from Eastern Illinois University and is a graduate student at UIS. For the past four years, he has spearheaded the Mayor's Monarch Pledge for the city of Springfield. This pledge includes implementing a demonstration garden, community education and outreach, and providing seed packets to the public. Recently, Quentin joined the many citizen scientists assisting in the University of Illinois at Springfield's pollinator project. So I'll turn it over to Quentin. All right, well, thank you, Barb. Hi, everybody. I am Quentin Jordan. Um, I hope you all can see me, but I am an engineering technician for with uh, CWLP. I've been working there for about uh, five years now. And I am the spearheader for the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which is Monarch Butterfly Conservation. <clears throat> so what is the Mayor's Monarch Pledge? It is uh, basically a monarch conservation effort made by the city of Springfield um, following the NWF's guidelines, which is the National, National Wildlife Federation. Um, where you basically change uh, landscaping practices within the municip uh, municipality. Uh, you also create habitats for monarchs and other pollinators, and you educate uh, citizens on how to make a difference in their own communities as well. Okay. Um, so you do this by creating what we call way stations. Um, those are areas where butterflies can um, migrate and mate uh, throughout their life cycles. There are two way stations here at Lake Springfield. We have one at Sunset View and another one at Orchard Lane. Um, these are perfect for establishing in uh, native or in gardens in urban communities uh, such as, or, yeah, sorry, went a little too fast, my bad you guys. Urban community gardens uh, such as libraries and schools. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is uh, one of the most important pollinators on the planet. Um, about 20 years ago, 1 billion of them made the migration from um, Eastern uh, North America to Mexico. And in the winter of 2014, only 60 million have made that trip. Um, it's estimated that the North American monarch population has declined by more than 90% over the last two decades. I believe by now that number has probably increased. So in order to understand more about the monarch, you have to look at their life cycle. Um, there are four uh, mating seasons throughout uh, the year, starting in March and ending in October. They last about two months um, in between or two to three months in between. Um, the monarch butterfly goes through a life cycle, a complete life cycle where it is an egg, hatches into a caterpillar. That caterpillar goes through a chrysalis stage where then it becomes an adult. Um, the mating season, monarchs lay their eggs on obligate milkweed hosts for about, oh, and those eggs, sorry, hatch in about two to five days. And the caterpillars themselves feed on milkweed sequestering toxins uh, for protection. And they feed for about nine to 18 days. Um, and then those caterpillars pupate into chrysalis, emerging 16 to, six to 14 days later as adult monarch butterflies. And they are sexually dimorphic, meaning that they have two uh, forms, one male and one female. As you can see, the difference between the male and the female is the venation. Um, males have more narrow venation, and they also have these things called scent patches um, as well. <clears throat> 
So uh, milkweeds, these are everybody's most uh, most hated, I guess. And <laughs> from what I've uh, discovered with gardeners, they're really noxious, but uh, they're important because they are the sole food source for caterpillars, um, specifically monarch butterflies. And the most common, there are four types that are most, most common in Illinois, and that happens to be the common milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and world milkweed. Um, and planting them is also beneficial for other pollinators as well. The common milkweed um, is native to southern Canada, and um, much of the United States east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, this is the one that you'll see most likely around the lake. Um, it grows to about five feet tall. I have some in my garden that are taller than me. So there's that. And I'm about five, eight, five, nine. <laughs> but, um, its leaves are also six to eight inches long and two to 3.6 inches wide. Uh, the flowers are in clusters and they can be anywhere from greenish pink to rosy and purplish pink. And the fruit pods, which are pretty common, um, store about 100 or 50 to 100 seeds um, with a white fluffy coma that is easy for wind dispersal, which is going to be a common thing with most of these milkweeds is um, their fruit pods and their seed dispersal method. The swamp milkweed, um, it is best grown in uh, moist or damp soils, and hence where it gets its name, blooms in mid to late summer, and its flowers can range from white to dark purple. Um, it, is a, it can get to around the same height as common milkweed, but um, it can range anywhere from three to five feet. Um, its leaves are actually oppositely arranged and are three to six inches long, and 0 0.4 to 1.5 inches wide. And their seeds are stored in green follicles that um, when ripe split open and, re and release flat seeds um, attached to silky hairs. And once again, they go through wind dispersal as well. So butterfly milkweed, which in my opinion is the prettiest of all three or all four, <clears throat> it is, uh, it can grow in dry, well-drained soils. It usually blooms in summer. Um, grows to about one to two feet tall, so not very tall in retrospect. And its leaves are also spirally arranged, uh, lanceolates, um, and are one to four inches long. And its flowers are orange and yellow. Uh, and the fruit pods are three to six inches long, and they have long hair seeds. So their seeds, seed pods tend to look like lima beans instead of a giant, um, I guess like a giant pod, but uh, world milkweed, which is the last one, is um, a species that's native to eastern North America and parts of Western Canada. It can grow from 0 0.5 to 3 feet tall. Its leaves are arranged in whorls, um, hence its name, and are um, connected by short internodes. And it also grows in dry soil and its flowers are uh, white and light pink with fruits that are 10 millimeters long, so not very big. So um, the monarch butterflies, butterflies migration. <clears throat> um, so some of them actually overwinter, the ones that are west of the Rocky Mountains overwinter um, in regions. Um, or on the coast of California and regions in that area. And then um, Eastern monarch butterflies tend to overwinter um, on the uh, coast, the East Coast of the United States and in Florida. And then North American monarch butterflies tend to migrate from lower regions of Canada and um, to Mexico. So they have a really long journey to travel between from Mexico to essentially the lower half of Canada. And so the, the thing about it is that monarchs are a flagship species. Um, they indicate water quality and, not water quality, sorry. They indicate agricultural quality 
and other natural settings. Um, so the decline in their population can be due to multiple things, including habitat loss, pesticides, disease, climate control, and extreme weather, um, predators, and anthropogenic factors. Um, of course, as we all know, there's not just one of those factors that's happening. It's a combination of all of those, hence why we've seen 90% of their population decline. Um, so, fun fact, um, they are not classified as an endangered species yet uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. They do recognize that it is threatened. Um, but they have not actually put it on their endangered species list or species list yet. Um, but as of 2021, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which I believe is based out of Europe, has um, added the monarch butterfly species or monarch butterfly to its red list, um, which is a list of threatened and endangered species or threatened with the species threatened with extinction. So um, aside from the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, um, there's also other conservation efforts that you can do in, in Illinois in general. Um, we actually teamed up with CWLP and the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, teamed up with iPollinate, which is a um, community science research initiative through the U of I um, Urbana-Champaign, designed to collect statewide pollinator data. Um, this includes enlisting community scientists like myself and others to participate in three research projects um, and collect data on monarch egg and caterpillar abundance of uh, pollinator visitation to ornamental flowers and state bee demographics. This is a picture of our current garden, which is about a four, 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 four by four plot and um, the list that I was given was a bestsellers list. So I have arranged here um, different, uh, different types of flowers, uh, basically for this garden to um, assist with this. So um, this demonstration garden, um, you can either have an ornamental species list or a bestseller species list. It's determined by the U of I based on your location and what I guess they need. Um, each garden is registered on an online database um, and those assignments are sent out to individuals based on uh, the U of I's determination. And um, here I have a picture of a floral survey, which is one of the surveys that they have you fill out. It's super easy to fill out. It only takes about uh, 10 to 15 minutes um, it, the study runs from June to September. There's one week each month, and it only requires one day of that week of each month. So four times, wait, maybe a little bit more than four. It's not quick math, but um, it only requires 10 to 15 minutes. And um, you can arrange the flowers however you would like, as long as they're in close proximity to each other. And uh, these are two other additional sheets that they have you fill out as well. One is a pollinator visitation sheet. So they actually give you online training to help you identify the difference between different flies and different bees, because those typically tend to be the hardest ones to differentiate. Um, if you don't know what to look for, uh, the key is usually in the wings. I think flies have four wings or two, thank you, and bees have uh, four, but um, there's also um, other insects and butterflies as well that you can monitor. So that takes about three minutes um, per plant. And then there is a survey data sheet um, where you could basically just explain uh, what plants are alive and what plants aren't alive and what made it through the season. Um, like I said, based on the the plot that they give you, they're already gonna kind of expect, um, they're gonna have certain expectations based on that, but um, everything helps when, when you're enumerating species throughout uh, the state. So this is how we kind of get to those estimations on um, population, monarch butterfly population within the state. 
So I have different resources here, including the Monarch Joint Venture, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, the National Wildlife Federation, the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the IUCN, and the University of Illinois. The University of Illinois Extension is also a really good resource. I mean, just the university in general is a great resource. Um, and yeah, so what can you guys do? You can try incorporating milkweed plants into your gardens um, or into community gardens as well. If you don't want to do it at your own house, that's completely understandable. Um, you can also spread the word to others about um, the importance behind monarch butterfly conservation. And you can participate in programs like iPollinate and other monitoring programs. Um, I also have my contact information up here and I have business cards and seed packets if anybody would like some as well. That's it. Do you have any questions for Clayton? Uh, I mentioned two locations around Springfield. Uh, yeah. What's that view and what was the other? Uh, Orchard Lane. So it is, I believe if you just go right up here, it's it's uh, right next to that greenhouse area. But, uh, but yeah, so. Um, yeah, hey, I can't see that well right now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't, I, so in my garden, I've noticed that they really like, um, my lavender plants and things like that, but I don't know if there is a specific combination of plants that they prefer. Um, I know in my garden, I've got a mixture between lavender, um, a lot of different cone flowers and, um, Bee bomb, but I don't think they, I don't know if it, if there is a specific plant aside from the butterfly milkweed. I know that there are different pollinator plants that can attract them better than others, but I don't know if there's like a specific preference, but I can find that out for you as well and uh, email you a species list to help if you would like. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so, thank you very much, Quinn. Yeah, no problem. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Burn is the caretaker of the thank you. <laughs> Burn is the caretaker of the Little Wildlife Sanctuary. He has worked for many conservation organizations and has been conducting stewardship and restoration projects for 30 years in Illinois. His work at the Nipper property began in 2005. He has extensive knowledge in constructed wetlands with constructing and designing over 45 wetlands in Illinois. He has overseen a four year study of biofiltration of wetlands on the Nipper Wildlife Sanctuary property. I'll turn it over to Vern. Thank you. I'm Vern Lejess. I hope most of you know me. My back is really sore, so I'm going to sit if you don't mind. What is a wetland? When I first started working out at Nipper, my wife asked me this question, where can I go see some wetland plants? To find a vegetative wetland in Sangamon County, I had to drive all the way to Mason County before I could find one that had actual wetland plants. There are not many of them left. They've been destroyed. In depending on who you ask what a wetland is, it's a whole different answer. In over my 30 years, they're all starting to filter down to a certain type of thing now. You know, Wikipedia says a wetland is land that is saturated with water, either permanently or seasonally. 
It takes on uh, and represents characteristic wetland plants. And wetlands are considered the most biologically diverse of all ecosystems. Wikipedia also goes on to tell us that uh, there are ecosystems that arises when inundated by water products and produces soil dominated by anaerobic processes in which forces of bio, uh, particularly rooted plants are adapted to surviving and flooding. We go to EPA, they're going to say nearly the same thing, and most of the agencies are going towards this hydric soil and anaerobic conditions. Wetlands are areas where water covers the soil, present either or near the surface uh, all year round, and varies from different times of the year. And they go on to talk about having hydrophytic soils or soils formed under that anaerobic process. DNR, who is the legislative body or agency that oversees wetlands, and it says that there are areas with hydric soils that are inundated or saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support uh, under normal circumstances the hydrophytic vegetation. Now these are plants that can only grow in wet spots. And they even have hydrophytic numbers for some plants and the higher the number, the more commonly you're gonna find it. This is a map showing the loss of wetlands. And we can see in Illinois, we're right in this map where we've lost over 85% of the wetlands that historically were here. When I worked with the soil and water, a wetland was described as any piece of land that holds water for more than nine days in a year. While it could be almost any ditch along the roadside in most of the county under that definition. I got started working with the Nature Conservancy, and that's where I learned how to develop and restore wetlands. And I like the history of things. And I got started up in the town, near the town of Sibley, Illinois, in Ford County. Now, Ford County was the last county in Illinois to be settled because of all of the wetlands. It was people were getting out of the War of 1812, and each soldier was given 10 acre deeds to land. Certain land barons were gobbling these things up and literally they were buying property in Ford County for $2 an acre. The Sibley Grove that I was working on was located right here at the bottom of the township. Any of these historic groves were protected by these historic wetlands. And just to the south of the township, to the south of that grove, we can see extensive wetlands. These are section lines. So this wetland over a mile long. And we just don't see these large shallow bodies of water. This was almost near the town of Melvin between Sibley and uh, Melvin. Melvin would be straight east of Sibley. And this wetland was over five miles long and over a mile wide in spots. This is the town of Sibley. And this is after 1857 when Mr. Sibley bought the farm back from Michael Sullivan. And Michael Sullivan had the biggest farm in Illinois, 44,000 acres on one farm. Siblings were, when they did stuff, they did things right. And going through an old storefront in the town while I was working there, these guys came out going, oh, we got something you're going to like. These are hand-drawn tile maps from the 1830s and 40s. In, oh, strong button. I was working on the Grove of Sibley which occurred right here and then in this piece right here. 
and they tiled out this large wetland in between. And that's what these tiles here represent. This is a blown up version of these tiles. Hiram Sibley lived in New York. He got laughed out of New York proposing that someone put a cable telegraph across the nation, went to Washington, D.C. and got federal funding and created Western Union. He had his own train going from New York to Sibley, Illinois. He brought in the first field tile to be brought into Illinois. And I, I was working on the grove, and before I started to restore the wetland, I got a phone call from the Drainage Tile Museum in New York, requesting if I could find any of the historic tile that they would like some. And if you go to New York, I have two tile on display there. I've got pictures of this wetland with a paddle boat on it and people singing and going around the wetland. And that was in the 1850s life in, in, in uh, Sibley. I was able to take in a backhoe and dig a deep trench through the wetland. And these are heavy peated soils. I unearthed a log that the museum dated to be 16,000 years old of black ash. And this would have been when the glacier would have been about at the Wisconsin border when these small trees were growing here. But just incredible what you find when you start looking where wetlands were. It was about six degrees out that day, and I went 30 feet down into peat soils. We found four species of fossilized seeds. I had green sedges blades in my hand that within five minutes turned black and blew away. But it was incredible to hold things that were 12 to 16,000 years old. In what was a cornfield, this is the Sibley wetland when I was done with it. And this started my whole career of starting to do wetlands. And since I wrote the bio, I'm up to 52 wetlands now. How we lost wetlands, Michael Sullivan hired Captain Bogardus, who's another of my big hunting heroes, to see if he could just shoot over 200 ducks and geese a day but it still didn't make a dent in the wildlife that were eating the corn on these farms. Sullivan created a ditching plow. It could cut a two foot by three foot wide ditch. It was powered by 64 oxen. I don't know about you, but I think it'd be a full day for me trying to get 64 oxen to all get in a row. But this is the only picture I can find of that kind of what it would have looked like. And it would have taken them most of the morning to just get them in line. This was a picture of one of the last ditching plows. And this is just, this isn't the cutting head. This is the craft. And they would flip this cart over so that those teeth went into the ground and you can see they've got a pulley system going from the plow to the cattle. And this ditch probably was cutting a six foot wide ditch when it was going. And this was uh, also up in Ford County, but the only or the last ditching plow uh, to still be remaining. And so they were feats of engineering. I grew up on the Kankakee River up in Kankakee County and the Grand March of the Kankakee was always the stories I grew up uh, reading about and trying to work. This is the Kankakee Marsh being drained by steam shovel boats. And so this was the next wave that plagued most of central Illinois and all the agricultural ditches that we see now going through some of the flatter ground originated with these machines. And this one was taking out a, a low rock dam near Moments that helped finally drain out the whole, uh, like 40 square miles of marsh. 
after the big machines came by, hard farmers just work hard all the time. And in Sibley, they would tell me once the corn was picked that they would trench and dig ditches by hand to set field tile. Sibley high, or imported field tile from Ireland were the first ones. But by this time, every big farm or area had their own tile company using the Illinois clay and firing it out. Here, I just love this. These guys got bow ties and dress coats on, and they're out there laying field tile. But in the Sibley story, they would leave, leave field tile until it was time to plow and start seeding in the spring. When I was digging out there, I could literally see trenches where they would dig down. It would be about two feet, 18 inches wide. The last six inches of the trench was dug between their feet. And you could see this clay profile and then black silted loam over the tile. But this took off the water in a much incredibly fast rate. And as Joe showed, historically, we just had wet swales and, and wetter ground. We never had actual current running off. But through the use of field tile, and I see these things plug up, a big storm blows them back out, and literally they're still functioning, you know, 100 years later. I came to Sangamon County and started to work at the Nipper Wildlife Sanctuary. And I'd never heard of it before, and it's the best kept secret around it, as far as I feel. But Mr. and Mrs. Mr. Nipper and his father ran the Bank of Loami. They ran it during the Depression. And the only person that had a good word to say was Mrs. Nipper about Mr. Nipper. They never had kids. No one in town liked them. And in his will, he left a 120 acre farm that was repossessed in 1933 over a milk cow to be restored for wildlife. And the only people that can use the property are for education or for conservation purposes. And in his will, he goes on to state no gardens, no weddings, no picnic tables, <laughs> which made my job so easy. When I first came, they were just doing the first area of prairie. This was planted with prairie, and uh, this was planted with prairie. This was kind of a hay meadow. Had a long ditch that ran through the property. You couldn't drive from one side to the other due to the ditch. I got a statewide uh, Army Corps permit to build wetlands where I couldn't uh, build a wetland a berm more than six feet high. I started at the culvert of the road and set in a little a berm here with the NRCS specs. And I set this all out with just a hand level. And when I did this, the soil and water office told me it wouldn't work, that I had too big of a watershed for this sort of project. Now they bring people there to show them wetlands. I had an unlimited budget and a permit. And as you can see, I just kept building wetlands. I built these four. I got down in the floodplain and built some more. And several years later, these were NRCS uh, designs uh, coming in. And so through persistent work, one can change minds. We had uh, piezometers or ground wells. And for one year, I had 50 of these going across that valley where I built the four wetlands. And I had transects of these going across the valley. And then for one year, we were able to measure the, the height of groundwater. And I was able to create topographic maps of the groundwater. It let me know how wide my cells could go east and west due to the groundwater component. Along that ditch, there were 
seven wetland species uh, growing along the little ditch. We dug them up, we potted them and replanted them. This is wetland two and three during construction. And it's amazing for me to see these pictures because it's hard for me to remember that this stage of this project. But I came from a background of construction. I'm the only here person here tonight without a degree, but I know all about heavy equipment and quite a bit about botany. <laughs> but I learned, I grew up running all of these types of equipment. We used ground control structures or water control structures, and we used this model here, the inline. And so here's my wetland. Inside this box, I can stack little plastic logs up that makes the water come up inside this side of the box is equal to the elevation of the pool. I can pull all of the logs and be nearly dry within about three or four hours. Controlling the water and restoring a wetland are so critical. If I want to grow the wetland plants, I got to drop a couple logs, expose saturated soil, throw my seeds on the ground. As they start to grow, I start to raise my water level back up. Some plants like cattails, I can lower it in the, in the fall. I can let it freeze, cut all the cattails off, raise it back up in the spring. And if I can get water over the cut surface of those cattails for two weeks, I'll kill them without even having to use herbicide. This was the fifth wetland after it was first constructed. And it literally abuts up to about 70 acres of runoff off of an agricultural field. Build it and they will come. If a duck will land in my wetland, it will bring me 44 species of wetland plants. Some of them I want, some of them I don't. I've also found that they'll bring me green sunfish and they play havoc with my small frog populations and beneficially with droughts, we kind of do management to reduce bullfrogs and fish every time we get the chance. But if I want more than 44 species of wetland plants, I've got to bring them in. We had an old oxbow down along uh, Lick Creek proper that I was able to restore, dig back out and get actually actively working. And we cleared a lot of the floodplain trees, all the trees with thorns we pulled out. We ribboned what native species were there in removing thorny trees is a dangerous operation and no matter how you do it, I look about how long do I want to work before I've got to pull a thorn out of my body and how often will that be my eye? And so I use big equipment. I worked with great people. They were able to pull trees out surgically. We had bonfires going, burning whole trees. And with the right tools, they can do incredible things. This was uh, part of the upland of the timber. Once it was cleared to die, we, now we've planted over 3,000 hardwoods in the same area. And it's quite a little restoration all in its own. Arrow leaf comes when the ducks land, one of our most common uh, wetland plants or hydrophytic plants. But once the ducks come, a lot of these things come. The nipper is different that we're in a state and so we can't hold money over. And so we truly have to spend money every year. The attorney general is wanting me to spend 5% of my gross. I work with JP Morgan executing the nipper estate they average about 8% uh, profit every year. And so we're spending 100 to 150,000 a year on the project if we want to or not. 
when we planted prairie, I had the ability to spend $3,000 acre, $3, an acre for seed. So we have plants out there that you won't find in any other restoration. When I was working with the friends of Sagamon Valley, we would take that seed and go all over with it for other restorations. More than wildlife, my wildlife supporters loved the project. And so they came out, we do lots of workshops for photography, for botany, and for anything else that anyone would like, I could probably work up a program for it. When restoring water, it is the easiest thing for restoration because you've got water. I've worked on dry sand restoration of sand prairies in Mason County. I can get the trees gone. I can put the seed out there. It might take 10 years for the moisture to be right for those seeds to germinate. Literally, when I'm building wetlands, when the bulldozer is going through the water, there are dragonflies laying eggs right behind the metal tracks. And it is incredible how fast these wetland insects can find these places. I was building some temporary little ponds in the middle of the high desert in Arizona for a project on the Little Colorado River up by Springerville, Arizona. I made these little pools of plastic in, in two by tens. In the first day, there were river oarsmen in the water. I was miles from any stream, and we were going to grow mats to bring to the stream once we started the project. But I could not believe how they found it. They must smell it. Many moons ago, Mark came out to me, and we wanted to do a demonstration with the 319 project. And they got some money to put a rain gauge out at Nipper, and they took water samples out of the first wetland, and they took samples out of the bottom wetland, and we found that we were doing an incredible job of filtrating nitrates and ammonia. We started a two-year project where we had a, it cost Nipper put in almost $44,000 in sampling equipment and a water laboratory. And then we hired Joe to make sense of our four year study. And so for four years, we've been out looking at water events. And so we have the upper wetland next to the cornfield. It crosses the road through pipe and culvert into the second wetland, the third wetland, the fourth wetland. And in the first two years, we would study the fifth wetland. When Lick Creek floods, it becomes the fifth wetland. And so those numbers were really skewing a lot of our water quality. But in the Lake Springfield watershed, you know, we're uh, out here. With the study, I'm literally 30 feet from the cornfield. And so our one input we take right here of water coming off the cornfield. We have a field tile coming off the same field. And then we have a culvert that takes the runoff out of this prairie. And so we're able to find three sources of runoff water coming into the first wetland. We then we're looking at elevation and then the water chemistry as it goes through the system. This is the little sub watersheds of uh, our little study. And so you can see the amount of agricultural field here and then almost equal coming in off of the, the prairie side. There is some side runoff on the wetlands as they go in a little bit from the road. This is uh, three years just looking at the elevation of the water in the first wetland. And so we've had a couple drought climates during this three year time. And we've had several large events. I think eight and a half inches was the biggest event uh, through this study. But here we've got one of our permanent sensors 
out in the wetland. And we've got of the four wetlands, three of or four of them have a, a sampler on them for elevation. This is standing on the berm looking at wetland one. Uh, our samplers on the bridge. We do our samples for this one on off of the bridge. And so it, at least easy access. Nitrates, phosphates, ammonia off the charts in this first cell. We get all these blooms that Tom was talking about and we get algae blooms uh, in what's incredible, they happen in the first cell. They never get present in the cells beneath it. This is wetland two, looking at it from the berm side, water sampler. This is looking at it from the opposite side during the drought. I had dredged this wetland once. Sweet flag is what we line, have lining our wetlands. They're growing in three feet of water to three feet out of water. So no matter what elevation, they've armored the, the bank. I'm getting no bank erosion due to the vegetation. After a decade of filtrating nitrogen and phosphorus in ammonia, Sweet Flag leaves me with about an 18 inch root horizon where water once was. And so with these kind of production wetlands, I do have some maintenance. And so I have dredged wetlands one and two to reduce some of the uh, vegetation. We took that material to other wetlands that we were working on or building. Wetland three, same thing from the berm, looking at opposite side across it. In the middle of this, in the summer, I invert aquariums so you can see what's going on under the water. We pull a vacuum and bring the water level up inside the aquarium. And if there are fish present, you'll, they'll come up and look at you out of the, the aquariums. But it gives you a sense of what's happening under the surface. Wetland four. And here you can see we haven't done anything yet, but there we are planning on reworking wetland three and four. And you can see how much it's filled in with vegetation. We started flying a drone just so we could start to quantify the plants in the water that were actually doing the work. And so we're talking about reduction, but we're trying to get some quantification of the actual plants. This is a sampling of all the events in a monthly routine maintenance or sampling events that we did. Once a month, we would go out if it hadn't rained in two days and we would take well, wetlands one through four and do all of our water sampling and testing. If it was an event where we had runoff happening, and I can't tell you how many times I drove all the way to Low Amy for there not to be any runoff. And Joe and all the other scientists would say, we want you out there at the very beginning. And you know what comes in the beginning of a front is a lot of lightning. <laughs> <laughs> and in the prairie, I am the tallest thing. And so I, I waited till the front passed. But you can see if there's sample, you know, if we got samples in these first three columns, those were storm events. These other ones were uh, routine sampling. And so over the four year period, we ended up with, you know, 48 different samples. I put up some of tables to show you this. And in our report, even during a six to eight inch event, we were removing 34% of the nitrogen coming through the system. If it was more of a gentle lag time, our highest was 87% reduction. These are averages over a three year period from each sample point. One T right off the cornfield of nitrate in all forms of nitrogen. You know, highest inputs right off the field. 
second right off the tile. This is the runoff from the prairie. And boy, the prairie loves nitrogen. It won't let it loose. It accumulates in wetland one, and we see a slight reduction as it goes through the system. Ammonia, same thing, off the field, off the tile, off the prairie, peak, slight reduction. Phosphorus. Now this is where prairies and phosphorus don't see eye to eye, is in the prairie, when I burn the prairie, my ash releases a shitload of phosphorus. And you can see here, my prairie is almost as much of a contributor for phosphorus after burning it as it is coming off the field. And in these wetlands, in the first decade, I can store and lock uh, phosphorus. After a decade, there are times when my plants go dormant that at certain times of the year, they're releasing phosphorus. And so I've become a small sink when it comes for trying to deal with phosphorus. And it's something we're looking at even in the dissolved phosphorus, the same scenario. I've been trying to work with some universities. If we can come up with some ex experiments for managing long-term phosphorus, we're wanting to talk with you because I think we've got the baseline study in the scenario to try to test some of this of how can we manage for phosphorus. This is the thousand dollar photo. Sample off the field in an event. Sample off the prairie. First wetland, second wetland, third wetland, fourth wetland. And even in an event, you can see the difference just in the clarity coming off of these things. I got into wetlands because I love plants and I'm a duck hunter. And so it kind of goes hand in hand but I never thought hunting ducks would get me into removing phosphorus and nitrogen in ammonia. But here, wildlife is contributing to your drinking water here in Springfield. And we've never been so proud to be part of the Nipper Wildlife Sanctuary. Thank you. Questions? Excellent. Thank you. More great presentations. More people have been able to join us this evening, but the presentations will be available on the website, as I mentioned earlier. Each of you should have received a green sheet that we evaluated. And if you wouldn't mind filling it out, you can uh, lay it up the table when you finish. And we still have lots of cookies and drinks back there. So if you want to get the refreshments again before the end of the evening, that's good.